Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> lovely, to, uh, lovely to be here together this morning, isn't it? And uh, worship God together. Um, if you're a visitor with us, you're particularly welcome. I can see there's a few unfamiliar faces. Um, please do stay around after the, the service. We'll have tea and coffee uh, on the platform here uh, for everyone. So please do hang around, make yourselves known. Uh, I think you might take the uh, take these these two here from Canada. So I think they might be uh, the furthest maybe travelling today <laughs> uh, to church. So you're very welcome. Um, just a, one uh, particular notice to uh, mention. Um, that's a week, week today. Week today, we're going to start a week of prayer. Okay, you've probably seen it on the screen. You've hopefully seen also Paul's email that he sent around yesterday uh, with the plan for that week. Uh, so the idea is same as last year, uh, where we don't do any of the regular activities of the church, some of the children's groups, and the other things as well. And instead, uh, we have various prayer meetings throughout the week um, where we meet and, and ask God to bless us as individuals and as, as, as a church. Uh, as well, so please take note of uh, what those what that schedule is, and if possible, plan to be at as many of those meetings as you possibly can. They're at different times to try and make them dif- uh, convenient to different people during during their days. So please put those in your calendar uh, and come and join us to pray together for as many times as you can during that week. So. Philippians, uh, in Philippians, Paul, the Apostle Paul, says this. He says, But everything that was gained to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You know, in religious terms, Paul had done everything right. Done everything right. God had taught him, though, that everything that he had done Everything that he had was completely worthless. And instead, his hope had to be in Christ. Well, knowing Christ for Paul and for us is our only hope. Our only hope of joy in this life with all the changing circumstances and our only hope of joy and peace with God in eternity. Well, if you know Christ this morning, as many of you do, I know. Well, you know both of those things. And we gather, don't we, this morning to rejoice in that together. Let's pray to our God and ask him uh, to be with us. Our Father, we thank you that we come before you, our God, who has done everything for us, everything that we need to be made right with you on our behalf. Father, we thank you that in Christ we have everything. And Lord, we pray that you would remind us of that this morning. We pray that through your Holy Spirit you'll be amongst us as we, as we sing, as we pray, as we read your word, the Bible, as Paul comes and preaches to us later. Lord, we pray that you will be pointing us to Jesus throughout this service, reminding us of what you've done for us through him. We ask it in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. First song, My Worth is not in what I own. Reminds us of that very same thing we've just been thinking about. Let's stand and sing together.
There's been a holiday club going on all this week, and Caroline is going to come and give a bit of a report. Do you want the youngsters to come to the front? Uh, Yeah, that would be great, please. I thought, who better, really, to give a report on holiday club than the children themselves? So if there's any kids here, particularly ones from holiday club, but otherwise any other children who want to come and sit down the front, please do not make me do this by myself. (laughs) Wow, look at the onslaught of children. (laughs) Some of them are on holiday. So we'll let them off. Oh, well done, well done. That's brilliant, thank you. So, so uh, I want to start off by uh, showing you a couple of the songs that we sang. So we're going to sing one of the songs first, and then we'll do the other one at the end. So guys, if you could please come up, and then you can show them the actions. You know I don't really know them. It's Jamie we need, isn't it? So do you want to come up onto the stage, and then you can show them? Well done. That's brilliant. You're very brave. (coughs) They're very brave. But if you want to stand up and join in with all the actions, we would love that. Okay, when you're ready, (laughs) Jess. not quite as brave today in front of you guys as they normally are but that was really brilliant well done now at holiday club this week we were asking them one main question okay so the main question hopefully is going to appear and we asked them why did Jesus come and the answer to the question why did Jesus come was the memory verse don't put it up Josh because there are some children here that I think know it. Now, I'm going to ask you to come in two stages, guys. So if you were in group one, do you want to come up now, first of all? Bea, that's you, isn't it? Lily, do you want to come? Do you not want to come? you want to stay there? That's fine. Right, come and stand here. Now, can you guys come and stand right at the front on this little grey stripe? Because all these people out there are desperate to hear you. Should we just ask Grace if she wants to come? Grace, do you want to come and do your memory verse? Do you want to come and do it? I knew you would. Come on then. Now, is there some actions, Luce? Shall I ask Caleb? Caleb, do you want to come and just show them, remind them of their actions? I just dropped that one on him now rather than ask him beforehand. Right, girls, come and stand over here because everybody wants to see you. Right, so if I say one, two, three, and then you watch Caleb and he'll remind you, but I need you to use the biggest voices you can. Can you do that? Do you think we can do it without the microphone? Are you that loud? Should we try? Okay, so we ask them, why did Jesus come? And their answer is one, two, three. Stay there, stay there, stay there, just stay there for a minute. 
Wow. See, even the youngest of children can learn the answer. Guys, do you want to come up and join them? And then you can do it in a big voice behind them. Okay, so come and stand behind these little dots. And then we will show you. So I'll do exactly the same again. I'll ask the question, then I'll say one, two, three, and you can do it. And you guys at the front can still do your actions, can't you? Okay, so are you ready? So we asked them, why did Jesus come? One, two, three. Well done, guys. Do you want to go and sit down again? That was brilliant. That's it. Well done. That's brilliant. So if nothing else this week, we know that there are about 80 children that have gone home with a verse of the Bible in their heads. Isn't that brilliant? That that seed is in their mind. So we're very happy about that. Um, then I wanted the kids to come and tell you, really, about how they got on. So while they're coming up, if you've written a report, do you want to bring it up? Bring Ned's as well, and I'll read it if you want. I want you to know that I just said to these guys, can you guys talk about what happened at Holiday Club? And that's all I said to them. And this is what they prepared for you. So who's going to go first? Vanessa's going to go first. All right. Does Vanessa know she's going to go first? Right, go sideways a little bit and come forward all the way to there. And I'm going to hold the microphone. OK, so Vanessa, what are you talking about? Um, I'm talking about the singing all and right. some of the talks. OK, go for it. Each morning as people arrive, Jamie would organise songs. He would give out extra points to the red, white and blue teams for the loudest singing and the best actions. Our voices went really hoarse after the first day, or mine did. Jamie would really encourage us to sing really loud and to push out of our comfort zone. He also encouraged us to do the best actions ever. Then Jamie would pray, but first he would do the prayer drill, a Whistlesea Baptist Church original. After he'd prayed, he would send the four groups their rooms to talk and learn about Jesus. Jesus. We also had a cafe running when the parents were waiting to collect the children. There were some really deep conversations going on. We had over 72 children on the second day of Holiday Club. All of the children thoroughly enjoyed themselves. We learned about what sin is and why Jesus came. We also learned about who Jesus is. That was brilliant. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> Stay there. Now, Ned wrote a report as well, but Ned's on holiday. So are you going to do both, Lola, or do you want me to do Ned's? Yes. I'll do Ned's. OK, what are you going to talk about, Lola? The stories. OK, go on, Ned. This year at Holiday Club, our stories were based upon our memory verse, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. On day one, we learned that Jesus is both fully human and fully God. He is sinless and came to save us. On day two, we talked about how Jesus is our rescuer and what it means, as well as speaking about other people who rescue us, like a firefighter or a lifeguard. On day three, we learned what, what it means to sin and how we can be saved from our sins. We learned that, Zac that we are like Zacchaeus, doing wrong things and needing to be saved. Lovely. Thank you, Lola. Okay, and Emily, what are you going to talk to us about? Um, the games. The games. Okay, come on then, man. This year of Holiday Club, I really like the fun games and earning all the points. I think the best part was the Easter egg hunt on day three. We had a sheet of paper numbers 1 to 15, and we had to look around the field for little squared pieces of paper. Every piece of paper has a number between 1 and 15 <laughs> with a word that answers the sentence, God is. For example, God is eternal or God is merciful. On the big sheet of paper had the 15 sentences, God is. Also, we had to find eggs and bring them back to the boxes of our team colours, blue, red and white. In each egg, there was a piece of paper with different amounts of points. Group 1 played a game called Funky Seaweed. Group 2 played with the parachute. Group 3 did the egg hunt. And Group 4 did dodgeball. With the points, blue team won, red came second and white came third. Brilliant. Well done. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to read you Ned's because this is what Ned wrote, but I need you to know I did not tell him to write this, okay? In group four, we had two options most days, which meant there was something for everyone. We could tell that a lot of thought had gone into every single activity. On day one was the option to make some bracelets, and the second option was doing some drama freeze frames, which came in handy for the story the next day. On day two, we did some junk modelling, which made some really nice pictures and they all looked amazing. 
On day three, we did some clay modelling of ourselves as our first option, and the second was making bookmarks, which said the memory verse. We had loads of fun, and I know every other group did, every other group had just as much fun by Ned. So that's Ned's reward. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yes, sit down. So the only other thing really to tell you about is the, uh, the cafe. So each morning we went from 9.30 till 12 and then uh, between 11.30 and 12 we had a cafe which we invited all the parents to come to uh, for that half an hour and we served teas and coffees and lots of cake. And I reckon we probably had sort of between 20 and 30 parents each day. Interestingly, they were often the same parents that came back three days in a row, which was lovely because it meant you really got to begin to build a relationship with them. There were lots of conversations about Jesus. So each, each of the um, team that came to do it had a card with the, memory ver or with the memory verse on it, so that would be a good starting point to talk. And people got to share their testimony. People got to talk about why they love Jesus. We got to talk about the different things we do at church. Uh, and it was lovely. It was really encouraging to be able to do that. Now, I know some of you are going to say to me, uh, did you meet the target audience? Did you get people from New Road? And I don't know the answer. Okay, but I do know that we sowed the seed in 80 children's lives. So maybe 100 people we sowed a seed and they, with the people that God sent us. And we now need to pray that those seeds would flourish and grow. We need to pray that whole families would come to know Jesus. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, we're going to just sing one more song for you, and then I think Doug's going to pray. So, guys, do you want to come up and do this last song? It's knock, not the one that goes knock, 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 knock. Yeah? So come and see if you can do it for me. Well, as Carrie mentioned, it'd be good, wouldn't it, to, uh, to pray for the, the youngsters who were there last week um, as a church together now, and, uh, and for those adults as well who came and we had that, those opportunities to share uh, Jesus with in some conversations in the cafe, uh, and pray that God would use um, all of these things uh, to bring people into his kingdom and save people in Whittlesea. 
So let's come together and pray. Father, we, we thank you that we can come before you uh, this morning and pray to you. Thank you that we can uh, call you our Father. Thank you as those songs that we've been singing already this morning remind us that your love for us uh, is so great uh, and so amazing, so uh, deep and so strong that you would send your son Jesus to die for us. So that when we, when we knock, when we, when we seek you uh, because of what you're doing in our hearts, you respond and say uh, to us that, uh, that we're okay because we can put our trust in our Saviour Jesus. Thank you that instead of seeing our sin, instead of seeing our wrong, that instead you see Jesus' righteousness uh, and his perfect life and that sacrifice that he made uh, on our behalf. Lord, we thank you that this message, uh, that's the, the, the core of the Bible, the gospel, the, the wonderful truth, the good news that, uh, that you share with us, that we're able to share it with others uh, in our town here in Whittlesea. Thank you that so many youngsters came to the, the holiday club uh, over the last week. Thank you that they uh, heard the good news of Jesus. Thank you that they were able to memorise that memory verse that, that Christ Jesus did come into this world to save sinners like us uh, and like them. And Lord, we pray that as they, uh, many of them sit at home, perhaps this morning, go out and, and about their day, that they would remember what they learnt. Lord, we pray that you would be speaking to them. We heard uh, on various occasions that a few um, of those children like to read their Bibles at, at home. Lord, we pray that you would um, be working in their hearts and causing many young people uh, to want to read and, and study and, and understand what you've got to say to them. Lord, we pray that you would open their hearts uh, and give them a desire to want to know Jesus. Lord, we, we know that um, the Bible contains the words of truth, that it's powerful because it's written by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we know also that your Holy Spirit needs to work in the hearts of those children. It doesn't matter what we do, what we say, you need to work. Lord, we pray uh, that you would do that through what these children have learnt this week. And again, we thank you uh, that we were able to share uh, testimony and share the gospel in simple ways with their uh, parents who came to collect them in the cafe at the end. Uh, thank you for all of those adults who were, who were spoken to. Thank you that a few uh, actually did express interesting, interest in wanting to know more. Lord, we pray that uh, for those who did that, uh, they would come and want to come to church, want to come and find out more. We pray that we would see them here over future weeks. We pray that they, they wouldn't see coming into a church building too much of a barrier, uh, that they would just have a great desire to want to come and learn uh, and find out more about you and more about Jesus and how much you love them. Lord, we, we thank you for... Uh, again, the way in which you've dealt with, with our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would uh, give us hearts that, that want to share the gospel uh, with, with many others. Give us hearts that are so full of joy and so full of understanding over what you've done for us, how dependent we are on, on Jesus, uh, that we would look with such sympathy and such love towards those around us in our town, in our families, in our friendship groups, uh, that we would want to share the good news with them and want them to experience that same joy, that same love that we've experienced from you. Give us hearts like that, Lord. Revive our hearts. Give us hearts that, that want to uh, please you as well. Lord, we pray that you would give us hearts that want to, to learn more about you. Lord, give us hearts that want to uh, read our Bibles every day and find out what you've got to say to us. And Lord, we pray to that end that you would be speaking to us this morning as well. Lord, as we, as we read the Bible in a few moments' time from Revelation, as Paul comes to speak to us from that passage that we read, Lord, we pray that you would be challenging us. Lord, keep us humble, we pray. Encourage us in the great news of the gospel. Help us to be completely dependent on Jesus for all that we are. 
Lord, we, we also pray for those who couldn't be with us, can't be with us this morning. Maybe they're on holiday, maybe they're at home sick, maybe they're feeling down, depressed, and, and, and can't face coming out. Lord, for any who that applies to, Lord, we pray that you would be their joy this morning. Uh, whatever they face, whatever hardship it is, whatever they're struggling with this morning, Lord, we pray that you uh, would bring peace to their hearts. We pray that you would bring joy to their hearts, even, even if they are suffering. Uh, Lord, may they say that they can see joy in Jesus this morning. Lord, we pray also for forgiveness. Lord, we, we thank you that there is forgiveness available uh, through that sacrifice of Jesus. Lord, we pray uh, for us that you would forgive our hearts this morning, forgive us. We know that we have sinned probably even this morning, even in, uh, before we came to church here. Lord, we pray that through Jesus and his sacrifice that you would make us right before you now. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn, another song this morning. What a friend we have in Jesus. A, a song that reminds us that we can come to him in prayer whenever we want. Let's stand and sing this together. Please turn with, you, with me in your Bibles, uh, if you've got one there, it'll also be on the, the screen behind me, if you haven't, uh, to Revelation and chapter 3, and uh, we'll be reading from verses 7 to 13. Uh, this is Jesus' letter to the church in Philadelphia. It says this, write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. 
Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this. I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come in the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, Doug. If you'd like to keep your Bibles open, or the the passages will be on the screen behind me too, we're going to be looking at that letter. But before we do, I just want to remind us, we're in the first vision here in the book of Revelation. And the first vision uh, begins with John just introducing himself, a great vision of Jesus, which then gets picked up in seven letters to seven churches. Uh, The first and the seventh church Uh, have significant problems. The whole church seems to have gone astray. Uh, Ephesus was a loveless church. They were working hard, but they didn't have a love for Jesus. And we're seeing Laodicea next week. It was a church that were relying on their wealth. They thought, we're wealthy, we have everything we need, and they weren't looking to Christ. And Jesus says his most kind of damning statements of those two churches. We then have um, Smyrna and Philadelphia, which is the church we're looking at today, where Jesus has nothing negative to say. There's no rebuke. Um, Smyrna is the persecuted church, and Philadelphia is the discouraged church. And then we have these three in the middle, where as we read the letters, we discover that there were some significant problems, but they weren't for everyone in the church. So Jesus is writing to the church, calling out the faithful and rebuking those who have turned away from him. These were seven real churches in modern day Western Turkey, um, but they're also representative churches. They are churches that as we read through, facing threats to faith and witness. And those threats we face today, We face them in different ways, maybe, but we face those same threats. So these words to the churches then are also words from Jesus to us today. And with that in mind, um, I want us to pray before we look at this letter, because we want to hear what Jesus has to say to us as his church here in Whittlesea today. So let's ask for him to make that clear uh, to our hearts. Father, we pray that the Lord Jesus would speak to us by his spirit uh, through these words today, that we will see where we are like the church in Philadelphia and that we would hear what Jesus has to say and the help that he gives. Amen. Let me ask you, have you ever been discouraged? Have you ever been discouraged? Do you know what it feels like to be discouraged. Have you ever been so discouraged that you've wanted to give up? Or maybe you've been so discouraged that you have given up. Maybe you're at school, or maybe you think back to a time at school where you're learning a subject and you're really, really trying hard, but it's not going in and you're just not understanding it. As the weeks go by and the situation's the same, you become discouraged and you think, I just don't want to bother anymore. Maybe it's with a hobby. When I was 40, I got an electric guitar, midlife crisis and all of those kind of things. And uh, it started well. I could play a note. But then I quickly discovered that my mind, because I 
can play music, and my hands, which couldn't play the guitar, were kind of not functioning together. And I got discouraged, and so I sold it on eBay. You can get discouraged, can't we, and want to give up. Maybe parenting. Maybe you're facing an issue at home as a parent of your children, and uh, it's not resolving itself. It's not solving it's You've read all the books. You've been online. You've got all the advice. You're putting in place everything, and your child is not responding to it, and it's not changing. You can become discouraged, and maybe you just say, I'm just not going to bother anymore. Uh, maybe in ministry. Maybe you're involved in a ministry in the church. Maybe you're trying to share the message of Jesus with someone. And yet the more you do it, the less it seems to work. And you become discouraged. Maybe following Jesus each day you get up and you say, I'm going to follow Jesus today, but it's a day of failure. And you become discouraged. Discouragement can be a powerful thing. A destructive thing in our life. When we become discouraged, we no longer want to do something. When we become discouraged, we no longer want to move forwards. When we become discouraged, we get to a place where we are happy to give up and stop working at things. Discouragement is a threat to our faith in Jesus and our witness as a church, if we get discouraged in ministry, discouraged in following Jesus, we get to a place where we want to give up. And that seems to be the case with the church in Philadelphia. They weren't doing anything wrong in their action. They were holding on to the word. Jesus had some positive things to say to them. But as we read the letter, it comes across that they were a discouraged church. Discouraged because there wasn't many of them. When it says weak in power, that means they were a small church. There wasn't many people there. Discouraged because they had this constant opposition from the synagogue. Discouraged, maybe, because they kind of had this cloud of imminent suffering ahead of them. Whatever reason it is, they are a discouraged church and therefore in danger of wanting to give up. So what does Jesus do? What does he tell them? What does he say to them? I'm so encouraged that Jesus doesn't tell them off. There's nothing worse if they're discouraged. Well, stop being discouraged. There's nothing worse than that. That kind of makes you want to be more discouraged or, or more sort of ingrained in your discouragement. Jesus doesn't tell them off. But he reminds them of four incredible gospel truths. Truths that if we reflect on them, should kindle the fire of encouragement in our heart. That's what I want us to look at this morning. See, are you feeling discouraged today? Maybe you are. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're involved in Holiday Club last week and you're on a high today because you've got to share Jesus with children. You've got to speak to people in the cafe. Can I tell you, those ministry highs do not last and maybe this week, maybe the next week, you'll come back to that place of struggling with discouragement. Are you feeling discouraged? It can happen to all of us. I encourage you with the encouragement of Jesus here. What are these four amazing truths? The first one. The first one. Jesus has given you a place in his kingdom. Is the first encouragement. Jesus has given you a place in his kingdom. Look at verse 7. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia... Thus says the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. Here, just as with the other letters, Jesus introduces himself at the beginning with things that are pertinent to the situation that he's writing into. So what does he remind them of about himself here at the beginning? Well, first of all, he is God. He is the Holy One. That's a, a way in which God has been referred to in the Bible. He is God. 
He is trustworthy. He is the true one. Everything he says is true. And then we have this phrase, the one who has the key of David. What does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus has the authority to let people into the kingdom of God. It's a phrase we read in Isaiah 22. If you want to turn there, you'll see a little bit more of the context. The verses will be on the screen. But sometimes it's helpful to actually turn to the passage and see what comes before and comes afterwards. In Isaiah 22 and verse 20, uh, we read, this is a, a prophecy from God. On that day, I will call for my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and tie your sash around him. I will hand your authority over to him. And he will be like a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. What he opens, no one can close. What he closes, no one can open. So here's this guy, Eliakim of Hilkiah. And here he's given this position in the city of Jerusalem. A position where he is the father of the inhabitants. He's a ruler in, in Jerusalem. He's the father of, of Judah. And then he has this key on his shoulder. What does that key symbolize? Well, that key symbolizes that he has the authority to open the gates of Jerusalem. So there's someone comes up to the gates of Jerusalem and they want to come in. Who can let them in? Eliakim can let them in because he's got the key. That's what having the key means, doesn't it? I don't know if you have it. Um, I remember several times coming home as a family to our house. We have a, a porch at the front of the house and we kind of all bundle into the porch and we, none of us can move until someone asks, who's got the key? And someone says, I've got the key. We open the door and suddenly we collapse into the house. We let people in. The person who has the key has the authority to let people in. And here's Eliakim. He has the authority to open the gate so people can come in. He also has the authority to close the gate so that people can't come in. And this picture then is used by Jesus to describe himself as he introduces himself to the church in Philadelphia, not a picture of his role in the physical Jerusalem, but in the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem that we read of later, that comes from my God in heaven. The people of God, the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, I have the authority to open the door to let people in. And I also have the authority to close the door to keep people out. So Jesus has authority to let you into the kingdom of God. But he doesn't stop there because you go into verse 8. And here he applies this, this authority and this position to his relationship with Philadelphia and what he's done for them. What does he tell them? Jesus has opened the door for you. I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Now, if you read books on the book of Revelation, this open door here causes a few issues in people's minds. What is it? And somebody from the congregation did ask me a number of weeks ago, what is the open door in Philadelphia? And the confusion comes from the fact that Paul, in his letters, when he uses the picture of an open door, it's a picture of an open door for ministry. God has given me opportunities to share Christ with others. And so Paul's use of open door often then comes onto here and it says, ah, oh, well, Jesus is saying to the church, although you're small, I've given you an area, an opening for ministry. So come on, get on with it. But that doesn't fit with the context of the letter. It doesn't fit with what goes before Jesus having the key of David. It doesn't fit with the personal encouragement that Jesus is giving. And it doesn't fit with how the open door picture is used in the book of Revelation. Twice, two other occasions where we have an open door. And they're all to do with fellowship or access to God. So 3.20 and 4.1. 
And I think if we follow the flow of this letter, the open door here is not an opportunity for ministry, but it is access to fellowship with God. It is the open door of the kingdom. Jesus is saying to the church, look, you may be small, you may be diminutive, you may be laughed at, you may be seen as nothing in Philadelphia, but I've given you an open door to the kingdom. You have a place. You have a place in my people, a door that you can walk through. Imagine the church there struggling. Imagine their discouragement because of their size, a small church. When you're a small church, and I, I don't know how small they were, maybe they're like a half a dozen or a dozen people. When you're small like that and one person leaves to go to Thyatira or to Sardis or to Smyrna, that is a massive hit on the church. But then they hear these words from Jesus. I have given you a place in my kingdom. I've opened the door for you. If you're a Christian today, I want to say don't be discouraged. Now look, we are not a small church. I know small is relative and maybe you, you see on TV a church of several thousand. You go, oh, we're smaller than that. We are not a small church. We are classed as a medium-sized church getting towards, or getting towards a larger church here in the UK if we take average sizes. We're not a small church. But that doesn't mean that we do not find ourselves in situations where we are on our own as Christians. Maybe in the workplace, maybe at school, maybe within our families where we find ourselves a small minority and the discouragement from that can come into our hearts. It can be hard as we pray for those situations and we don't see them change. When you get discouraged, Jesus is saying, don't, don't get so involved in that situation that that is the only reality that you see. Now look up and see what I've given you. A place in my kingdom. A door that is open, that no one can close. A, a, a part to play in a massive group of people. A group of people that spans all of time and all of space, that, that contains everyone from all time and from every country who has ever and will ever put their trust in Jesus. You're not alone. You're part of the people of God. That's the first truth that he encourages them with. Let's look at the second one. What's the second truth? Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Look at verse 9. Note this. I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet. And they will know that I have loved you. Now, Jesus here is responding to a situation that we don't fully know the details of. We know some of the details. It's a situation that's occurring because of opposition from the synagogue in the city of Philadelphia. The, the Jewish people um, who have remained Jews and not become Christians, uh, they are opposing the church. And something about that opposition seems to be making the Christians in Philadelphia doubt whether they really are God's people. If we're to imagine it, maybe it's something like this, that the synagogue is saying, look, we can trace our origins back to Abraham. We have circumcision. We are the people from the Old Testament. Who are you? You're so little. You're so insignificant. We're the people of God, therefore knowing God's blessing. And, and you, who do you say you are? Something like that is going on. And the church in Philadelphia is becoming discouraged by this and beginning to doubt their own salvation and their own place in God's plan. What does Jesus say? What does he say? He says two things. 
The first is this. The Jews that meet in the synagogue in Philadelphia are not God's people. You notice that in the passage? What does he call them? They are a synagogue of Satan. They claim to be Jews. They claim to be my people, but they are lying. They are not my people, Jesus says. They are not God's special people. Now, maybe you feel a bit shocked by me saying that. Certainly, the Jews in Philadelphia would have been shocked if they ever heard that Jesus said that about them. Because they would have looked back to the Old Testament and said, oh, look, we got this lineage from Abraham. Abraham received this promise from God. It was to his seed, to his people, and it's been passed on from generation to generation to generation to generation all the way through to now. And we are part of the Jewish people, and therefore we are the people of God. But Jesus says no. And in fact, the New Testament says no. How come? Because if we go into the Old Testament, what we're looking at is a time of shadows and pictures. So we've got a physical people of God, the Old Testament Israel, who then have a spiritual remnant in them, those who are looking forward to the coming of Christ. So it's not that no one in the Old Testament is not a real believer or a real person of God, but you've got this physical people. But then Jesus comes. The fulfillment of all that. Jesus comes, who, who that all points to. Jesus comes and he is the true Israelite. He is the true seed of Abraham who inherits all of the promises. And then as we come into the New Testament, he is Israel. He is the people of God. And he shares all the benefits of that with anyone who comes and puts their faith and trust in him. And because the Jews who were in that synagogue had rejected Jesus as God's son, had rejected Jesus as God's king, had rejected Jesus as the true seed of Abraham, they weren't God's people. Because it all hinges on Jesus. And so Jesus says this shocking news to them. The synagogue of Jews in Philadelphia are not the people of God. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have any plan to save people from the Jewish nation. It doesn't mean we shouldn't take the gospel to the Jewish nation. Paul in, in Romans encourages us, said, well, because of the history, we should almost do it more. But the Jewish people are not the special covenant people of God in the New Testament. Now we come on to them in the next thing that Jesus says. What does he say? The Christians in that little tiny congregation in Philadelphia, they are God's people. They are God's special people. What does he say about them? They are part of the nation of God, the nation that the, the whole world will have to come and, and bow before and recognize. They are the people that Jesus will say, I will make it known that I love you. Now, what does he mean there? When we talk about the love of God in the Bible, there's two ways which we talk about the love of God. One is a general love of God for all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That love that supplies needs for Christian and non-Christian. That love through common grace that does good all over the world. That love that says, I do not desire that any should perish but all to come to eternal life. There's this general love of God for everyone. But then the Bible speaks about the specific covenant love of God. The love of commitment and protection and provision. The love of keeping and forgiveness and mercy and grace. That specific love that he makes to his people where he commits himself to them and binds them to him. 
And that's the love that Jesus is talking about here. Not just a general love, this specific covenant love. And he says, I am going to make it known so the whole world, and particularly these Jews, will see that I love you. If you're a Christian here today, don't be discouraged. Because Jesus loves you. Yeah, do you ever feel small? Do you ever feel insignificant? Do you ever feel like a waste of space? Yeah, that sort of discouragement can come from lots of angles. Some of it is true. Yeah, we can be discouraged because of our sinful hearts. And that's true. We can be discouraged because we fail. But that's true. We can be discouraged because we're weak. That's true. It can be discouraging to see who we are. Some of that discouragement, though, also comes, and it's not right. People can be out to shame us for things we haven't done, to make us feel small when there's no reason to. Bullies do that. People who undermine do that. That discouragement can come from true places and untrue places. Wherever it comes from, however you're feeling, Jesus said, don't focus on the discouragement. Don't make that the chief reality in your life. No, look upwards. Because whatever else is said about you, if you're a Christian, Jesus loves you. You can put your name in that statement. Jesus loves you. And in the end, he will announce that loud and clear to the world. Jesus loves you. That's the second truth. The third truth, Jesus will keep you. Jesus will keep you. Look at verse 10. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? Let's ask a couple of questions of this verse just to try and uh, get our heads around what he's saying. Here's the first question. What is the time of testing Jesus is referring to? What is the time of testing Jesus is referring to? Well, ultimately, it seems like he's referring to what we call the Great Tribulation, which is a time of testing, a time of intense suffering that will come before the return of Jesus. It's, it's what Jesus speaks about in Mark 13. For he says, for it, those will be days of tribulation, the kind that hasn't been from the beginning of creation until now and never will be again. If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved. But he cut those days short for the sake of the elect whom he chose. So Jesus here, as he looks towards his return, speaks about a time coming before he returns, which is a time of intense suffering that is Greater suffering than has ever happened before and will ever happen again. The great tribulation. So Jesus seems ultimately here to be talking about a time of testing that's going to happen at the end of time before Jesus returns. But here's the thing to note. With these biblical prophecies, there is always an ultimate fulfillment, but often... There are micro-fulfillments on the way through. So here with this tribulation, there is this great tribulation that is coming, but there are these mini-tribulations that will come. And we'll see that as we go through Revelation, things like the, the seals being opened. There's a final seal, the great, the great kind of judgment to come, but then there's all kinds of judgments on the way. And it's the same with these times of testing. So there's a big time of testing coming, but there will be times of testing on the way. And so as we look at this, ultimately Jesus is talking about the great tribulation, but in, in the kind of context that he's speaking to, 
they're also going to live through some of these mini tribulations because the people who were alive at this time didn't make it to the great tribulation because it hasn't happened yet. So there's also these mini testings. So have that in mind as we read this. But secondly, what does Jesus mean when he says he will keep you from the hour? What does he mean when he says that? The Greek can be understood equally in two ways. The first interpretation, Jesus will take you out of the suffering. He will lift you up out of the suffering. It could be that there's a a particular time of testing coming to Philadelphia, but Jesus is going to move this church over to Smyrna or over to Ephesus or somewhere else so that the church itself won't have to go through that time of testing. That would be keeping them from the time of testing. Or, Or it could be that they will die. That doesn't sound like a nice thing, but it is, isn't it? Because if they die, they go to be with Jesus, which is better by far. And Jesus has allowed them not to walk through that pathway of testing. Some people teach, and we're going to come back to this, some people teach at this point, uh, taking it the great tribulation, that this verse teaches that Jesus is going to come secretly before the great tribulation and take all of the church away so that they won't live through the great tribulation. It's called pre-tribulation rapture. If you want to, maybe you've heard of that from somewhere. So that, that's a teaching that some people say this verse uh, leads to. So that's what it might mean if we're saying Jesus will take you out of the suffering. But there's a second interpretation which is equally as valid, that Jesus will keep you through the suffering. He will protect you in it. He will strengthen you. He will give you sufficient grace so that as you go through this time of testing, you will be able to stand in it. Both of those interpretations, if we just look at the phrasing of the Greek and the words, are equally valid. So which is it? Here's my answer. Half of one and all of two. Why do I say that? Well, because God does take us out of suffering by moving us to another place. God does take us out of suffering by taking us to heaven with him through death. But I see no evidence in the Bible of a pre-tribulation rapture where the church is lifted out of the world before the Great Tribulation. In fact, what seems to be clearly taught, like from that Mark passage, is that the church will be here during the Tribulation. And Jesus says the days are going to be cut short for the sake of the church because they're going to be living through it. So I think if we're talking about the, the kind of the, the many tribulations or, or God just being gracious to a, a few and, and taking them uh, somewhere else or, or lifting them up to heaven before something happens, then we can take that interpretation that Jesus will take you out of the suffering. So it's half of one, but all of two, because the Bible over and over and over again speaks about God protecting us in the difficulties of life, no matter how great they are they get. So Psalm 121 would be an example. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter at the right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. He will keep you through the time of testing. So if you're a Christian, I want to say don't be discouraged. Do you find yourself in a time of testing? Do you find yourself maybe through physical health or or health or circumstances or temptation? You're finding yourself in a place where every day you are battling and nothing seems to change. There's no breakthrough. And to be honest, it's just grinding you down. Jesus says, I want you to look up. I want you to hear my words. I am with you. And I will keep you 
through this time of testing. That's the third truth. Here's the fourth one. Jesus promises you a place in glory. He promises you a place in glory. The one who conquers, the one who conquers in Revelation is the one who is faithful to the end, who keeps their eyes on Jesus, trusting in him. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. So the first three truths are are, are truths that are about now. Here is a truth that's about the future. Here's what Jesus is promising. He is going to make you a fixture in glory. He's going to make you a fixture in glory. Here's the temple of God, the eternal temple of God. And as you come in, there's these beautiful, ornate columns. They are beautiful and ornate columns, the the ones in the buildings of the, the day of the first century. Beautiful things. Those columns are also integral. They're not just there to look nice. They hold the place up. They're integral. They're also pretty solid. If you go to Athens today and go and see the Parthenon, Parthenon, Oh, Pant- Pantheon, Parthenon, that's the one. That's the right word. Um, so you see the Parthenon in Athens. What is it that's still standing? The pillars. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to make you a pillar. Beautiful, integral, and solid in the kingdom. The eternal kingdom of God. And then he says that he's going to give us a triple locked place in glory a triple locked place in glory three names what are the names signify here in this passage they signify belonging remember i went to a a youth conference and um, i was speaking at it on one day we we went out for the the day and we had to make packed lunches that were then transported we were going on a walk they were transported by cars up to the top of a hill. So we made our pat lunches and uh, put them in bags. And there were about 100 people. So how do you know which pat lunch is yours? <coughs> you put your name on it. And it says, this belongs to me. That's the picture here, he's naming. Jesus is saying, I'm putting names on you. And these names signify who you belong to. Three names. The name of God. You belong to my God. And therefore you belong in his kingdom. The name of the city of Jerusalem. You belong in the city. And therefore you belong in the kingdom. And then the third name, the name of Jesus. You belong to me. And so you belong in the kingdom. Three names. Not just one. So it might be rubbed off and then, ah, what's going to happen? Three names. Triple locked. It is definite. It is certain. No one is going to have any cause to boot you out of glory because you are not legitimate. Jesus promises you a place in glory. If you're a Christian, don't be discouraged. There are so many things that can get you and me down, aren't there? Life is not always full of joyful victory. Life is not always full of times of of encouragement. Often it's full of hardship and struggle. We are often called to be faithful to Christ in the grind and in the brokenness. But Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia and says to us today, don't let that define your heart. Look up and see Jesus. And what does he say to you? If you're a Christian, that that is key here. All these encouragements are absolute, definite for Christians. If you're not a Christian, you cannot claim these encouragements. But here's the thing. If you come and believe in Jesus, and Jesus invites you to do that, then all of these things become true for you as well. Jesus isn't saying you can't have this. He's saying you don't have this yet. But you can if you trust in him. If you're a Christian, what does Jesus say to you from heaven today? I have given you a place in my kingdom. 
It's mine to give, and no one can take it away from you. I love you with eternal covenant love. I will keep you, and there is no struggle that you will go through that I cannot keep you through it. And I promise that you will be with me in glory. A pillar in the temple of God. With the Father's name on you. The name of the city. My name. In glory with me. Shall we pray? Father, help us to just meditate and think about these encouragements today. May they lift our souls. May we see that the gospel is so much better than anything else. May we understand what you've done for us in Jesus. And Lord, whether we're here today on a a kind of crest of a wave of encouragement or down in the dumps with discouragement, Lord, we pray you would lift our eyes to see the wonder of Christ. Amen. Well, let's sing of the mercy of God, the things that he has done for us in Jesus. So the mercy of God, the glory of grace that you chose to redeem us, to forgive and restore. Shall we stand and sing?
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.